heaven right now. What a belief. Om Namo 
Bhagavate Vasudevayo So we are studying Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 13, Text Number 11. The chapter is entitled The Appearance of Lord Varaha. Satvamasya, Satvamasya, Satvamasya Mapatyani. Sadrishani at Manogune Utpadyasa Shadarmena Gam Jagge Purusham Jagge Satvamasyam Apatyani Sadrishani at Manogne Utpadya Sashadarmena Gamjage Purusham Jaga Sa, therefore that obedient son, Twam, as you are, Asyam, in, in her, Apatyani, children, Sadvishani, equally qualified, Atmana, of yourself, Gunai, with the characteristics Utpadya having begotten Shasha rule Dharmina on the principles of devotional service Gam the world Jage by sacrifices Purusham supreme personality of Godhead Yajya, 
worship. Translation, since you are my very obedient son, I ask you to beget children qualified like yourself in the womb of your wife. Rule the world in pursuance of the principles of devotional service under the supreme personality of Godhead and thus worship the Lord by the performance of Jagya. Purport. The purpose of the material creation by Brahma is clearly described herein. Every human being should beget nice children in the womb of his wife as a sacrifice for the purpose of worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead in devotional service. In Vishnu Purana 389, it is stated, Varna Shram Charavata Purushena Brahpuman Vishnu Aradhyate Panta Nanyata Toshyakaranam. One can worship the Supreme Personality of God in Vishnu by proper discharge of the principles of Varna and Ashram. There is no alternative to pacifying the Lord by execution of the principles of Vana Ashram system. Vishnu worship is the ultimate aim of human life. Those who take the license of married life for sense enjoyment must also take the responsibility to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu. And the first stepping stone is the Vana Ashram system. Vana Ashram Dharma is a systematic institution for advancing in the worship of Vishnu. However, if one directly engages in the process of devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it may not be necessary to undergo the disciplinary system of Vana Ashram Dharma. The other sons of Brahma, the Kumaras, directly engaged in devotional service and they had no need, and thus they had no need to execute the principles of Vana Ashram Dham. Om Ajnati Rangasya Janandana Tulakaya Chakura Militan Yena Tashme Shri Gurave Namaha Durga Me Pari Mendasya Skalapati Gati Bhusva Kripa Yustu Danena Shantu Shantu Avalambanam so here we are continuing on with um, Lord Brahma and his beginnings uh, procreating in the material universe. So Lord Brahma performed his tapa, his penances, and then of course the Supreme Personality, God Lord Vishnu, he awarded him the knowledge how to proceed with creation. So we know Lord Brahma is called the creator so, therefore, he began this task of populating the universe. And the basis of the creation, as is explained here, was the Vedas. And we read a couple of uh, shlokas back about how the Vedas were born out of Lord Brahma's mouth. So, here in the purports also explain that the guiding principle enunciated within the Vedas is the Varna Ashram system which automatically sets up the different categories, uh, not only for human beings, but also for the demigods, the uh, four orders of social systems and uh, uh, spiritual, um, the spiritual uh, demarcations as well. So in the previous sloka, number 10, we're dealing with the fact that um, the sons of Take uh, the sons uh, obedient to the father's instruction. That is the process of Vana Ashram system. That when the father uh, begets a son, it is expected that the son will do what the father says. So, um, so in the Vana Ashram system, so we have the different. Uh, different um, categories, so we have the Brahmanas, we have the Chatriyas, and the Vaishyas and the Sudras. So if someone is born a Brahmana, it is expected that his son will also become a Brahmana as well. Or if somebody is a Chatriya, then the marriage is arranged where the Chatriya will marry another Chatriya wife, 
sometimes they take a Brahmin or wife but it's within the categories or sometimes there's a Vaishya wife as well just like in the case of uh, Lord Krishna um, <coughs> his father Vasudev he had several wives and one of, one of his wives um, <coughs> was uh, Rohini who gave birth to Balaram in a village so she was from a um, um, Vaishya caste but then Devaki his uh, wife who directly gave birth to Lord Krishna who's from a Chatriya but they're very careful not to uh, mix the caste so they don't marry a suitor what, because there's a, uh, there's a demarcation there and then if that happens then sometimes there is a, uh, the progeny does not live up to the expectations of the, uh, of the father so similarly in our western society in the early beginnings we had a feudal system way back when, like with, with England, and um, that feudal system was also based on Vada Ashram. So sometimes we have inherited names like blacksmith, which of course refers to um, shoeing horses, a cooper, any coopers here? So that's making barrels. <laughs> um, and it goes on, um, mer a merchant, so we know what they do, bishop. You know, like Mr. and Mrs. Bishop, right? So that sort of self explanatory at some point in time, they had the task of uh, some religious um, function. So like father, like son. So what to speak of Lord Brahma's surprise, so he's expecting this to happen. The Vedas have come out. Everything is really set up for him to procreate. And the first sons that are born out of his uh, mind, uh, first sons that are born from him, not out of his mind, but they're born from his um, where's it? From his shoulders, was it? The four Kumaras? Where? Uh, some. From his mind, okay. So they're born from his mind and his beautiful sons. So he's beginning to instruct them on the Vana Ashram and the Vedic system, like their um, duties. But they rejected that and they disobeyed his instructions to adhere to this system and become progenitors. So he basically wanted them to become uh, grihastas. So when they said no, he initially became angry at this because it was totally unexpected. I mean, he didn't expect this, that some of his first sons were going to say no. But the Kamaras had a higher goal in this universe. So as we know, um, they were very, very advanced sages so they were so advanced that they realized the trappings that Lord Brahma set up for them that you know to procreate the universe so to avoid the trappings they stayed as uh, five or six year old boys they're just very um, and it's said that they were covered by the four directions which means that they were totally uncovered you know so they walked about as young boys but they were the oldest uh, souls in the universe apart from Lord Brahma so they were great sages so the not only that but they were uh, one of the 12 Mahajans it's quite amazing that actually all in all Lord Brahma is one of the Mahajans one of the authorities on spiritual life in the universe the four Kamaras and also Manu apart from the other uh, nine so um, the authorities on devotional service and the four Kamaras are actually they were tapasvis, they were into performing penances and austerities and as such they lived in Tapaloka which is right next to Satyaloka, right up there at the top. So the thing about um, Tapaloka is that um, it is not subject to annihilation at the end of Lord Brahma's day. So we know there are so, so many different annihilations. There's a full annihilation at the end of Lord Brahma's life but also at the end, end of his day which is 8 trillion 864 million years or so so it's quite a lengthy period of time Lord Brahma sleeps for one night the same period of time and at the same time Lord Vishnu also uh, goes into slumber so on Tapaloka um, they're untroubled by this because actually that survives the devastation because at the end of Lord Brahma's day everything gets devastated including Svargaloka, the heavenly planets. 
Sanatanga Swami gives us an elaborate description of this in uh, Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, which is very, very interesting because it talks about the travels of one devotee of the Lord, um, <laughs> Kamar, what's his name? <laughs> Gopa Kamar, who um, actually takes instructions from a Brahmana in a from a devotee in Vrindavan and he gets a seed mantra and he's told to always chant his seed mantra and by chanting this seed mantra he's able to go to different destinations looking for the Lord of his life. He's dressed as a cowherd boy because that's what he was and he'd come across his bum and there was so much ecstasy he said um, He's, he's so much in love with the Supreme Personality of God, the Brahman, he gave him the mantra by which he could achieve that love, but he didn't explain the mantra to him. So <coughs> um, he fell into an ecstatic swoon, swoon and disappeared. So <coughs> um, um, uh, the Kamar, what's his name? Sorry. I went to the festival last night. I'm still reeling. From, so Gopa Kamar, so he's looking for him. Not only can he go all over the earth planet, but he can actually transcend not only the celestial planets, but go further up. So in his search, he goes to Jagannath Puri, and he goes to Mathura Dham, and then <coughs> he hears that the worship of the Lord is always this, after worship of the Lord, and seeing the beauty of the Lord. So he's hearing that the big Jagyas are there in the celestial planets. So he goes to the heavenly planets of King Indra, and each time he goes somewhere, he's given the position of the uh, person, like he was in charge of Jagannath Puri. But then um, he heard that the first Lord personally comes uh, in his form in <coughs> the heavenly planets. So he went to the heavenly planets. And then from the heavenly planets, uh, the Jagga was before Lord Vishnu would come. But then there would be elaborate process where Lord Vishnu would disappear until the next Jagya and he felt the separation. So he was still pining and he was always attached to chanting his mantra. So by the power of his mantra he said that there's somewhere where you can go where the people always worship Lord Vishnu and he appears. So that was Mahaloka. So on Mahaloka we have the heavenly planets, Svogaloka, Mahaloka and Janaloka. So Janaloka, Mahaloka are in more or less the same levels. And on Mahaloka, there's great sages that perform so many different uh, austerities, fire sacrifice, and in each fire sacrifice, the Lord appears out of the fire and he actually takes the oblation. He personally accepts the oblation. So Gopa Kumar was in complete ecstasy because everywhere there's a fire sacrifice, he's seeing the Lord appear here, the Lord appear there, and then the Lord lovingly uh, um, gives him some of his oblation and he reciprocates with Gopa Kumar in that, that manner. And Gopa Kumar is in ecstasy for a period of time, but then he finds that still there's that period where they do the sacrifice, and to do the sacrifice, they have to prepare, chant the mantras, and at the end of it, the Lord comes and he disappears again. So he feels that anxiety that the Lord's disappeared out of his life. And he's chanting his uh, seed mantra, and he's in his coward clothes, and the Brahmin's saying, hey, you know, Get out of these coward clothes. We'll make you a brahmana, right? We'll dress you in brahman clothes. We'll show you how to do the jagya, and the Lord will appear in front of you like that. And he's worried that he won't get a chance to chant his seed mantra, and he doesn't want to give up his cowherd clothes. He just said, that's my swadharma. I'm a cowherd boy. So he's a little bit uh, agitated, and then all of a sudden he sees that all the sages get up and pay respects to this great... Um, soul that has just um, descended out of nowhere on Mahaloka and it just happens to be Sana Kumar, right? This five or six year old boy, naked and all the sages are getting up paying all their respect because they see him as a great sage right? And he said, where's this man come from? And it's described that he comes from Tapaloka so in Briya Bhagavatam Rita it also gives the description that even Mahaloka, the citizens of Mahaloka at the end of the destruction of, um, in Brahma's day <coughs> they get scorched by the heavenly planet Svagaloka so they have to leave Mahaloka and go to Yandaloka and some have actually go up to Tapaloka. So when they get to Tapaloka then 
they're untroubled and they can live the whole duration of Lord Brahma's um, life there on Tapaloka. So Sana Kumar, he moves up to Tapaloka by the power of his mantra. Hmm? Oh, so Gopakumar. <laughs> so Gopakumar moves up to Tapaloka by the power of his mantra and he's performing all the tapasya. And then with the tapasya the there, they don't need to do um, ritual sacrifices there. They just meditate on the Lord within the mind. So when he arrived at Tapaloka, <coughs> all these uh, sages were animatedly, animatedly discussing the pastimes of the pre-personality of Godhead and he was just a simple coward boy. He didn't understand what they were saying, but just by the power of their words, he was becoming very ecstatic. And <coughs> then they all went into meditation and he didn't have anyone to talk to. Like they were all just meditating the Lord and the Lord was appearing in his so many different forms within their mind. And then, of course, I'll leave it there, but there was a big discussion of people, Ayana, and it was talked about jnana versus bhakti. So that's a really nice sloka, that a uh, nice segment of that chapter which goes on, bhakti versus jnana. So ultimately, um, the fact that he had his seed mantra and he didn't want to get into this meditative trance, he wouldn't be able to chant his seed mantra. He stick, stuck with the instructions of his spiritual master and he persisted in his journey and he kept going forward. So I wanted to sort of mention this because this is the first um, instance, or this is another instance of Sanat Kumar, who was respected as um, a, a great um, sage, great devotee, and he was beyond the Vedic system that he was, um, him, he and his brothers were able to travel not only throughout the this particular universe, but at will, the Kamaras were able to go to the spiritual world as well. They went to Vaikuntha, and we know about Vaikuntha, that they got to the door, and uh, they were stopped by the gatekeepers of the spiritual world who mistook them to be boys. What are these boys doing here? <laughs> what are these boys doing here? Right? And they just saw the bodily features, and the Kamaras. They got upset and the sages say, so some commentators say that actually because they were in the bodies of five-year-old boys, they actually acted as boys because, uh, you know, a five-year-old boy, you try and stop him from going somewhere and he'll throw a tantrum, right? So in the body of the five-year-old boys, they become angry and they curse the, um, curse the gatekeeper, Jai and Vijay. But apart from that, we have the four Kumaras there, so... They transcended Lord Brahma's instructions. So here um, we see, actually that's a very interesting point here because sometimes we have followed in the, the footsteps here because not only did um, some of us uh, have to surpass our parents' instructions, so we all were brought up in the Western, most of us were brought up in the Western society or even in the uh, system where in India where Varnashram is still prevalent and somehow or rather we rejected our parents calling to become um, good materialists, have a nice family and um, develop a bit of wealth and security and um, make a um, imprint on the material world there and add to that, ra rather that we rejected that and accepted the higher state of consciousness which is spiritual life. So that was to our parents' chagrin and I think most of us who are full-time devotees, especially in the beginning, uh, all of us did that, you know, somewhere along the line we had to make that transition where we have to tell our parents, um, I'm sorry but uh, I'm going to join the Hare Krishna movement. You know, I'm going to become a devotee. And that comes as a shock to these people because they don't understand the difference uh, between spiritual and material. They say, why do you want to do that? Of course, it all ends up okay in the long run because uh, in spiritual life, it's yukta vairagya that we follow um, whatever we can do in Krishna consciousness or whatever is in the material world we can utilize in Krishna consciousness. So, so we, what do you call it, 
level out, some of us. Some of us don't. Some of us stay on the spiritual path. But after a while, because the spiritual path is so strong, the purification is there and most instances the parents become purified as do our relatives and accept the fact that their, you know, their son or their daughter is uh, very happy in their position and we do have a position in society is to actually emulate what the four Kamaras did and give spiritual instruction throughout the world. So this is a groundbreaking system because Lord Chaitanya, Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya, he explained this, that I'm not a sudra, I'm not a, I'm not a vaish, not a, I'm none of these, I'm not a man, not a woman, not a householder. I'm actually a servant of a servant, a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So Vaishnav is standout highest, is a standout, is higher than any uh, uh, any designation in the Vana Ashram. And he exemplified this by having his Namachari, his greatest devotee, Haridas the core, as his principal devotee in Haridas the core came from a Mohammedan background. And because there was so much controversy there about a Mohammedan being uh, the highest uh, devotee of a uh, supreme personality of Godhead, the um, caste communities, the Brahmanas, they could not um, understand this, comprehend this, accept this. And of course, Haridas went through so many tribulations to, um, in his, um, in his uh, life uh, of um, adhering to Krishna consciousness. So the, Lord, the Kamaras, they didn't help Lord Brahma. So this, in his, uh, in his mission of populating the universe, so in this particular sloka, he's praising his son Manu, who is actually a very, very loyal servant of uh, Lord Brahma, and he actually becomes a progenitor, and he's the father of civilization. So it's described here that Lord Brahma was very pleased that Manu accepted the order. And we have the example of a perfect son. So Manu, um, although he's a perfect son, the father of mankind, uh, still he was exhorting people to follow the Karmakanda section of the Vedas, which accordingly means uh, following one's occupational duties. And as we know, he wrote the Manu Samhita, uh, which delineates all the good things about following the Karma Kanda section of Veda and, and the bad things as well. So, as devotees, we respect that Manu is a very, very senior authority, but that is not our principal shastras that we study because actually that is still with the Karma Kanda section. Most Karma Kanda sections of Vedas talk about. Svargaloka achieving the higher realms, the higher goals, and uh, rarely is, a li and as far as liberation goes, there is the Vaikunta, but it's said the authorities say, Lord, uh, the, I can't think of a sloka where the authorities always say that actually the devotee rejects liberation, not only Suyuchi book, but the other four kinds of liberation because he's completely attached in his bhakti, in his devotional service, free person of Godhead. So we have the example of the perfect son and not, not so perfect son. And it's uh, come down like uh, we have uh, sometimes rejected our parents' um, orders because uh, <coughs> it's very difficult for the parents to accept spiritual life. Sometimes in India, people um, like this. <laughs> they come and they say, take my son, make him Krishna conscious, right? So we offer to make him Krishna conscious, but they don't want him to come too Krishna conscious. They don't want to become devotees, you know. Then they get upset. Oh, no, you took my son, he's supposed to be a university student or whatever, so forth. So they just want a little bit of Krishna consciousness. There was that story of Srila Prabhupada, which I really dearly love, that Gurudas was talking about where Prabhupada was on a train going from Punjab to Delhi, and there was four or five devotees in the compartment with Prabhupada and they were all comfortable there. But then on the train when um, Indian 
people see a sadhu, they want to get the benediction of the sadhu. So it was the job of the devotees to keep everybody out of the compartment, so many people trying to get in. So somehow or other, this just <laughs> two students were sort of had their shoulder in the door or something, and they were trying to keep them out, but Prabhupada saw them, and he said, let them in, let them in. Right? So they sat them down, and he said, and so, <coughs> what would you like? And they said, oh, Prabhupada, we would like a benediction from you. Right? So he looked at them and he said, I benedict that you become like these boys here, like shaven heads, <laughs> orange robes. <laughs> and they stood, as they looked at each other, and they sort of faded, sort of from arms and very hastily retreated from the cavern. You know, they didn't want that benediction. You know, they become something else, get a bit of imperial life. So similarly with us that we, you know, I was, a, I was born in a Catholic, raised in a Catholic, and it was expected that I follow the traditions of the Catholic faith and become a good Catholic or whatever, but I became a Hare Krishna. So I'm a Hare Krishna, and then I have children, and I hope that my children will become Hare Krishnas, but they actually become something else. So this is the state of the world today. I mean, with Lord Brahma, it was expected that the Kumaras were going to become know, um, follow his order. But in, in the world today, it's not so much uh, clear cut what happens because all the souls that are born in this world, they have their own constitutional, um, constitutional, well, no, not constitutional, they have their own desires. So we're all in Kali Yuga, particularly, it says, Ichadvesha Samutana, that we're all born with the dualities, desire, and envy and hate and whatever we have to conquer over these factors. So um, we have. So therefore, we it can we are very happy to see that someone will become a devotee because that is a very very rare soul. But we do have good examples that we can follow. Just uh, one example is. Um, uh, Apart from Manu, is a Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. She loyally, loyally followed in the footsteps of his father, Bhaktivinoda Thakur. As we know, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he found Chaitanya Charamrita, he found Vaishnavism, and he began to establish Vaishnavism in the um, 1800s, particularly in Jagannath Puri. And he gave birth to one very, very loyal son. It's said that actually when the son was born, he took him out on the Rathiatra parade to see Lord Jagannath. We all went on the Rathiatra parade last night. It was a magnificent parade. And he was showing his son to Lord Jagannath when one of the garlands fell off Lord Jagannath on top of uh, his son, uh, Bimla Prashad Thakur. So... That was a very auspicious sign. Of course, Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati continued to propagate the Krishna consciousness movement. Later he went to uh, Mayapur and then he also established 64 centres throughout the world. And at one of those centres, Srila Prabhupada came along and he received instruction from his guru. So sometimes it's said that the guru is like the father. So Srila Prabhupada honoured Bhaktisiddhanta's instructions and kept them to his heart uh, more so than um, any other relationship even though he had a really good relationship with his father and he <coughs> followed the um, instructions of his father when he guided him with his marriage and also when he wanted him to become a devotee he said that his mother wanted him to become a good materialist and his father wanted to become a good madanga player <laughs> chant bhajans. So in, in that way, so Prabhupada also uh, very much adhered to the instructions and because of that we have what we have today that we're able to um, follow uh, Srila Prabhupada's footsteps and propagate this uh, wonderful Krishna consciousness throughout the world. That is the higher purpose. So ultimately the goal is to please the spiritual master so we need the spiritual master to give us this guidance to actually uh, connect us with the Parampara system and 
take us into the depths of um, spiritual life because as we can see that there are so many different checks and balances, so many different paths. So when we have a bona fide spiritual master, we're very lucky that we just stay on this path. Somebody asked me yesterday what's it look, how it's very difficult out there in the material world. Um, what can we do to uh, stay in Krishna consciousness? So I compared the material world, it's like a jungle. And we have a path through the jungle, we've carved the path. But you go off the path and you soon lose it. The jungle just sort of completely obliterates where you're going. So very important to stay on the path and that's the association devotees and taking instructions and of course chanting um, the holy names of the Lord which when you do it's the principal part of nine process devotional service and you immediately develop an attraction for the deities because Krishna and his name are non-different and that attraction for the deities is very infectious and people come here and they think, what is so special about this place? There is one lady here for the third time, third weekend in a row, and she knew nothing about Krishna consciousness. She just felt that someone had this vibration about it. I said, where do you, where, where do you get the, your energy from? You look so good. And she said, I'll just go to the Krishna farm, Krishna village. So she tried it. Now this is the third time she can't stop coming. She's got the energy. Right? Where's the energy come from? It comes from Krishna. It comes from within the heart of the devotees. So that is the takeaway that uh, here the spiritual path is the greatest goal of life here. And we have such a rich heritage. And the Shruva Bhagavatam actually um, gives us a proper perspective on how to lead our lives. So does anybody have any questions or comments? Just on the material life, spiritual life, you must know that famous saying Prabhupada said, right? A material life is difficult. I'm sorry, spiritual life is difficult, yeah, but material life is impossible. <laughs> you go off the path, you get stuck in the jungle. And it's uh, material jungle is pretty bad. It's like the 15th chapter of Bhagavad Gita talks about the bunyan tree. That's just amazing how the bunyan tree grows and you l I just look at the bunyan tree sometimes there's some bunyan trees in Eustead in Brisbane actually there's a whole little grove of them and you just see that the roots the, 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 the branches they're actually going down into the ground and then once they hit the ground they become roots right? and then they become another trunk and you can't see which is the original it's just like this complicated sort of system here you can't see um, you can't see anything it's like they say, you can't see the forest for the trees. Yes. Regarding his comment that difficult, spiritual life is difficult, at the same time Krishna said, it's susukam kartam abhyam. Can you please explain that? It's like another example is like, <laughs> there's a friend, there's a, one of KK's sons, right, they decided to go for a walk. They thought that they could park their car on Yukai Road and cross this mountain and end up on the farm and someone could, go, someone could give them a ride back to their car, right? So they started walking up the mountain and they didn't get very far when they realised that all the trees just covered every direction and they couldn't see where they were going and they got completely lost and they had a banana and an apple between them, I think, and they were totally inappropriately dressed. They had thongs, and then his friend slipped and cut his leg, so he had to carry his friend. And finally they found a little stream, and then that stream took them back down to the road. They got back in the car and come back again. So sometimes we take these sort of paths that, um, you know, <laughs> we think, oh, this is a really, well, we're not deviating too much, we just go down this path. And then... It's obvious the fact that actually Krishna within the heart gives us this realisation that this is not really 
Yukta Vairagya, we're not going down the path. We're actually going down the path for our own, um, you know, our, uh, our own pleasure potency, our own sense gratification, might say, or our own sort of um, material life. So it's slightly deviated from the original path. So sometimes Krishna gives us this lesson, and always the guides is the Shastra there in the association of devotees, Sadhu, Sangha, and Shastra. Okay. Those things, devotees don't take it as difficult. They, tell, they see it as mercy. That's what Prabhupada says. Material, mundane people, they see all as difficult, but devotees, devotees see everything as Krishna's mercy. So that when you see as mercy, it becomes susukam kartam Thank you, yeah. That's the only way to see things because the material world has got so many deviations. One of them is a, we've just been discussing that um, you know, we're never happy with the situation, sons and daughters or parents or whatever, but there are so many other different reversals. This is Sukha Dukkha. So everything, even the Dukkha, everybody wants the Sukha, they want the mercy, they want the happiness, but the Dukkha is there. So that's just two sides of the coin. So whatever happens, then we see this as Krishna's mercy to help us understand the temporary nature of this material world. So this philosophy stands us in good stead. It's the only philosophy that actually explains this properly. You have all the other philosophies in the world, Christianity, Islam, uh, Buddhism, um, atheism, agnosticism. They don't fully explain that situation, what is Krishna's mercy. So the devotee is very fully conversant with Krishna's mercy. Any other questions, comments? Jai, all oh, glories to Prabhupada. I have made a mess here, really big one, too scared to get up.